Hey everyone, uh, this is probably a familiar sight to Commodore 64 fans. Um, now what you're looking at here is not an emulator, it's um, a Commodore 64, a real one, but not 100% uh, a real Commodore 64. This is in fact my own replica of a VIC 6567 video chip uh, I built on an FPGA development board. Uh, let me just increase the brightness here. Um, so it's wired directly into the socket or the VIC socket on the uh, motherboard. So I have all the address lines and data lines and uh, other lines hooked up. Um, so what you're seeing here is actually running on, or the video anyway, is being produced by that, um, by that, uh, the core that's running on that FPGA board. Um, so the idea here is to eventually maybe develop some sort of drop-in replacement. Um, so if the 6510 is the brains of the Commodore 64, then uh, the VIC chip is the heart. Um, it's responsible for providing the clock signal to the CPU, as well as uh, DRAM uh, refresh signals. Um, so nothing will work without the VIC. Um, so this is my prototype here. Uh, it's kind of hard to see because this camera does not focus well. I can't really exp uh, control the uh, exposure, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's quite the uh, the mess in there. So I just I'm just going to go through some of the uh, technical details, uh, kind of a deep dive into how I started this project and um, and how it progressed over time. Okay, so I was just interested in making a 6567 replica for a while now. I just wanted to try my hand at, at doing it. Um, I think other people have written, you know, VIC-2 cores included with complete FPGA-based Commodore 64 implementations, but I couldn't find anyone that did uh, a drop-in replacement. Uh, I did some research, and the only project I found was something called FAL6567 on GitHub uh, by Rob Finch, and uh, this is an unfinished project. And if you drill down into this uh, directory, you'll find a schematic um, as well as uh, a, a PCB um, for something that could serve as a drop-in replacement. So what you're looking at here is uh, the, the same FPGA development board that I just showed you that would sit here. This would be the, um, the piece that would, that would connect into the VIC, uh, the socket. And then you have a bunch of supporting circuitry here. He has a VGA connector. Um, so I took a look at this project and uh, as I said, it was unfinished. Uh, I, I actually contacted him um, and he, he said, I don't think it got past the simulation phase, but he did a ton of work on his core that was written in Verilog. Um, I'm using that as uh, that project as a reference, but I actually started my core uh, from scratch so I can understand. I wouldn't have understood it or learned as much if I had just tried to take um, uh, everything wholesale. And I'm also taking a different approach for some things and I'll, I'll uh, get into that a little later. Um, so Rob's uh, original vision was not only to create just a drop-in replacement, but also add uh, a math coprocessor, additional registers to control timings, video timings on the fly. He added eight more sprites, an external color palette, uh, the VGA connector. I wasn't actually interested in any of that. I just wanted something to be a, a drop-in replacement. Um, and so this is his board design. I looked at his project for a while, uh, decided to start my own uh, project. Um, and like I said, I'm doing things a little differently. As far as hardware goes, uh, I'm, I'm working on this uh, Atrix A7 FPGA development board, uh, CMOD A7. Um, I'm also bringing in a composite encoder IC, and that's the little chip that you saw on the board there um, next to the FPGA. It handles uh, the composite encoding for me. It's just something I didn't want to have to bother with. You could probably do this on the FPGA uh, itself, but I'll leave that to later. And then, of course, you have the uh, supporting search circuitry around it, like most notably the, the bus transceivers. So this is what, every, what those two major pieces uh, look like. Now this FPGA board is 
overkill for um, for a VIC-2. It, it, it is capable all on its own of being an entire Commodore 64. So, uh, you know, this is just being brought in for uh, prototyping purposes. A smaller FPGA could be used um, later. So this is the idea. Um, you have your FPGA, you hook up your address data bus and other lines through the, these uh, bi-directional bus transceivers and directly into the Commodore 64 VIC-2 socket. I'm going to do things a little differently. Uh, instead of having a VGA connector, I'm going to drive this composite encoder IC. And it's a, it's a simple IC to drive. You basically give it three things. You give it uh, RGB analog channels, uh, a sync signal for the horizontal and vertical sync, and then a color subcarrier um, for the, uh, the color encoding. And it will take care of producing chroma, luma, and composite uh, video. Um, so that's my, that was my hardware plan. Uh, I started off with a very small Verilog program and the purpose of this was just to drive the 1645p uh, composite encoder. So it was very tiny, it had, it had XY registers, uh, the correct limits for a 6567 in terms of um, pixels wide and, and, and pixels down. I added uh, border and background color registers, um, the H-Sync, V-Sync pul pulses, the border and graphics boundaries, uh, the same as what you would find on a Commodore 64, and then just a simple 4-bit index color, RGB222, um, and uh, put this together, um, and this is what it ended up looking like. So this is the composite encoder I see. Over here you'll see uh, the, the three pairs of wires, that's the RGB signal, the RGB222 lines. They go into a resistor ladder that eventually go into the analog in pins of the, uh, the encoder. And then I take the, uh, the video out and go, go to my monitor. So this is what it looked like. Um, very few, you know, nothing was hooked up to a real Commodore 64. Again, this is just to drive this uh, composite encoder IC. And uh, hooked it up to my composite monitor and uh, got this. Um, after some troubleshooting, I'm, I'm skipping over all the troubleshooting, of course. Um, but it looked, you know, it looked uh, like the beginnings of the 6567. The 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 border looked, uh, the colors were not a, a, a match because uh, I only have two bits per uh, RGB channel. Um, but it was looking good up at, up at this point. So I was confident that I could, you know, control pixels on the screen uh, from an FPGA. Uh, so I started to uh, think about, um, well, how, how do I want to start developing from here on? Uh, simulation is really important when you're developing for FPGA boards. Um, first of all, I wanted to reproduce all the graphics tricks you can do with the VIC-2 um, in kind of a controlled environment, uh, verify visually frames matched expected behavior. I wanted to look at logic levels and a logic analyzer and possibly script scenarios to set data and address lines uh, to produce a, a single frame and then take a look at what it looks like. And it's really difficult to, like it takes a long time to synthesize your core and flash it to your device. So you kind of want to uh, do this um, more rapidly. Um, so I decided to use something called Verilator. And uh, th so this project is, uh, is written in Verilog. Um, and what Verilator does is it converts your Verilog into C++ uh, and then you can wrap your own um, simulation tools around that. So it, it gives you a mechanism to step your clock uh, one tick at a time, set your data lines, read your data lines, and um, it's a, a nice simulation tool. Um, so, and Verilator can export uh, VCD files, so this is an export of what you know your 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 uh, CPU clock and your dot clock looks like. Um, here's what the uh, the horizontal uh, sync pulses look like. Okay, so I'll just launch the simulator just to demonstrate how it works. Um, you run fixim with dash w. You can run it without any arguments, and it will do a simulation, but you just won't see anything. So that, so the dash w means open up uh, an STL window and so I'll do that here and uh, this is what it would have looked like um, when I verilated my simple FPGA core with, with just the XY registers and the border and the timing. Uh, now this is actually running the latest version of the core but you can see nothing is actually happening uh, but this is what I got.
Um, the, the black bar on the left here, this is the horizontal uh, sync pulse or sync interval. And then the bar at the bottom here is the vertical uh, sync pulse or a vertical sync interval. So if I change the chip, for example, I can say uh, Vixen-WC0, which is the 6567. So what you just saw was the 6569. Um, so you can see that the, uh, the, the vertical sync pulse is in a different spot. And um, uh, I'll just go back to, the, uh, to this one. Um, so what you're seeing here is uh, just my uh, code uh, in this, around the simulator to open up a window, an SDL window, and uh, it every dot clock tick, it will take the RGB values that are coming out of the, um, the pixel sequencer and uh, plotting them as the XY coordinates are, are being uh, you know, incremented across the screen. And uh, so this is what I saw uh, after I ran my code through Verilator and added my, uh, my window code. So another thing I can do is add a dash T argument. And what that does is it tells uh, the simulator to um, trace the signals and dump them out to a VCD file. So let me just run that uh, again. It's even slower this time. So it's, uh, it's recording uh, all the uh, transitions um, at every tick to a uh, .vcd file, and then I can say make logic, and that will uh, invoke GTK wave on that VCD file. And then uh, I can go in and inspect the, uh, the signals. So here I have a whole bunch of different signals, uh, but I can uh, zoom out here and let me just go. So th this line here is the raster line. Let me just go to a, an interesting raster line. So here you can see those bad lines happening. And uh, so this is just an invaluable tool you know, I use to go and inspect and, and see what's going on uh, in the simulator. Um, okay, so the simulator you saw um, was not really doing much other than showing the border uh, and, and uh, background colors. Uh, and that's because nothing is really driving the, the data lines or the address lines. Uh, nothing's really changing. So I thought, um, what better tool to bring into this, but Vice. And Vice, um, I thought, could act as a, uh, a stepper um, with the right integration to, to tick the simulator, the Verilog simulator forward as it emulated uh, each half cycle. And um, so this is my own uh, uh, concoction. It's uh, an IPC bridge that I created that I uh, so I found the um, the perfect spots inside Vice to um, kind of capture when uh, each cycle is is happening and whether or not a CPU access uh, CPU read or write access happened and uh, every half cycle is basically stepped um, uh, sorry every half cycle steps the FPGA by a half cycle and it's actually at the um, one sixteenth of a cycle resolution. Uh, because I end up timing um, the, uh, the the setting of the lines, uh, which I'll get into later. But the idea here is that you run your vice simulate, you run your vice emulator, your Verilog simulator. They connect uh, together through a shared memory segment, and uh, at any point you can run. Um, at any point when you're running your your application inside Vice or your program, you can uh, enable a sync and. Uh, that will start stepping the Verilog simulator uh, after having sent over the the state of the VIC of the uh, the Vice's VIC uh, into the simulator. It'll start stepping it, and uh, cycle by cycle, it should be in sync with um, with the Vice's VIC uh, state. So so really, the Verilog simulator ends up shadowing uh, the the VIC, the emulated VIC chip inside Vice. Um, so I, I developed this bridge out and I'll get into more of what that looks like uh, inside uh, a little later, but I ended up developing uh, more registers inside my core. I added uh, chip enable, read write uh, lines, uh, the address and data bus uh, lines. Um, and uh, I just made sure that my VIC2 IPC bridge inside Vice sets these lines appropriately at the right times. Uh, 
So if I go back here, um, I mentioned that I have uh, basically 1 16th resolution per cycle. So that's eight steps per half cycle. And uh, that's necessary to set things kind of at the right time um, in, in as, things, as um, the cycle progresses. Um, so I, uh, this is kind of more of uh, an in-depth look at what's going on here. So you, you would run your Verilog simulator, you run Vice, you load whatever program you want, and then you enable the sync, and I'll, I'll get to how you enable the sync uh, in a minute. And then on the first 1 16th cycle step request uh, that, that happens, and this is again in the, just in the perfect spot in, uh, in Vice, that uh, sends over from Vice into the simulator the initial state synchronization information. So that's not just register information, but also as much of the internal state of the VIC that I uh, could could get into the the equivalent uh, registers and internal registers of the of the uh, the simulator of the of the FPGA core, and then from then on, uh, after that response, it says, "Okay, uh, I'm I'm in sync with you," um, and it will step through uh, at at a one sixteenth cycle resolution, and at the end of every uh, step the Verilog simulator sends back to Vice what it thinks the, the state of the VIC should be. And after eight steps, that's one half cycle, uh, Vice, the Vice bridge will do a comparison between what Vice thinks those registers and what that internal state should be against what um, the, the simulator is telling it it is. And if there's any discrepancy between the two, it'll print out a warning at that point. So at every half cycle, you might get uh, some sort of warning as you're running uh, the program, uh, stepping it cycle or half cycle by half cycle. And uh, when that happens, I can go and take a look at uh, what caused that discrepancy. So I thought this was going to be a, a, a useful tool to develop out my core. Uh, how do you turn on the bridge? So there's a couple ways. The first way is I added a, a fake register. Uh, D3FF. Now that that doesn't do anything on a real Commodore 64, but on my uh, uh, if my VIC um, IPC bridge is installed, then it will turn on the shadow sync. So this is something that you could do either in assembly or basic. You just uh, poke a one into that location, and it starts um, it starts off the sync. Um, so I decided to write a test program uh, at this point. Now my, my FPGA core was qu still quite simple, but it did have a couple registers uh, that I could change, and that's the border and background color registers. So I just whipped up this uh, really simple program uh, to enable the sync and then toggle the border color between white and black. And uh, then it just loops, and it just does that forever. And uh, if you run this on Vice, this is what you get. You get this, this uh, background pattern. Uh, that just happens to line up in, in some cases. Um, and it's just an interesting uh, pattern to look at uh, for comparison. So um, I made sure that my bridge would simulate uh, the bus activity properly, in, including timing as close as what I could get it to look like on, um, uh, on or what it looks like on an oscilloscope. So there are basically three cases that you, you have to deal with. There's a CPU write, a CPU read and a VIC read. So the VIC never writes to anything, it only reads from memory. So this is showing what happens uh, when Vice detects that the CPU wrote uh, during a half cycle. So on the first step, it'll make uh, read write lines low, set the address bus pretty much at the same time. Then on the second step, makes the chip enable low, sets data bus pretty much at the same time. And then it will step through the remainder of the cycle and uh, around step five or six, um, the Verilog uh, simulator would have set the data lines um, appropriately, uh, or sorry, read from the data lines appropriately and perform that register set. So this is what it would look like on a logic analyzer. This is the uh, address lines being set. Uh, you can see the read write line going low, chip enable goes low, data goes, um, data lines are set. And then at some point over here, the Verilog uh, will react to this, pick up this, this data, and then perform the register set. And then uh, 
Similarly, this is also done for CPU writes and uh, Vic reads. So uh, I incorporated this into my simulation and I ended up getting a pixel perfect match between the, the simulator and what Vice was producing. So what you're seeing here, um, there is no text there because I, at this point I did not have, um, I did not have a text mode implemented. So it was just the border colors, uh, color registers that were reacting to uh, all those uh, sets. So this demonstrated that the IPC bridge idea was gonna work um, and I was pretty happy with the results uh, at this point. So um, I started to build out my core more. I added my own uh, Vic cycle, uh, Vic um, state cycle manager to keep track of what activity the Vic is performing uh, for the current cycle. So this is kind of what it looks like. You do sprite accesses and then there's a there's a DRAM refresh uh, happening and then it, it uh, reads from the character pointers and bitmap uh, graphics and then there's a little idle phase and then it goes back to the sprites and it just loops around like this. And uh, there are subtle differences between different versions of the chips which I also do handle. Uh, the schedule is just a little bit different for each of them. Um, I also added uh, the BAAC lines. If you're familiar with um, how the uh, CPU interacts with the VIC is that the VIC has, it sort of owns the low cycle or the low phase of each cycle and the CPU owns the high phase of each cycle. But the VIC can sort of stun and suspend the processor uh, at any time by lowering this uh, BA line and it allows three more clock cycles before it lowers the, um, the, the this AEC line uh, and then from that point on the VIC owns the bus so it can do uh, reads on all these uh, cycles and then at some point it, it, it lifts the, uh, the BA line again and then the CPU can go. So this is what's known as a bad line uh, because it's, it's, it's called bad because it's basically stealing cycles away from the CPU. Um, I also added uh, CAS and RAS uh, signal uh, pulses to refresh DRAM. So this is one of the differences, you know, in if you were to write an FPGA core that is being an entire 64, you wouldn't have to worry about this because there's no real DRAM. But in this case, you have a real data bus with real DRAM to refresh. So um, had to add that as well. Um, so then I did uh, character accesses and graphics or bitmap accesses. Uh, kept enhancing the uh, the bridge to set the uh, the bus values according to what uh, addresses show up. Um, and uh, when the FPGA sets an address on the bus, Vice will peek into Vice's memory tables and set the data bus, um, taking into account Vic's view of memory. So this was cool. Um, uh, I wanted to make sure that. Uh, you know it, that the FPGA would read, you know, something read memory, and it's trying to basically read uh, Vice's memory tables, but it's doing it sort of at the signal level. Not it's not just kind of reading a whole byte, right? Um, and I tried to get the timing for for this all correct uh, by comparing comparing it to what I saw on the oscill on the oscilloscope sometimes. Um, so this is how the VIC sees memory. Uh, I just took this into account when an address is uh, set by the VIC to read, it actually depends on what bank it's viewing. And those, um, uh, the uh, address lines on the VIC are only, there are only 12 address lines, but the, the, the other two uh, remaining um, address lines are provided by one of the CIA chips. So you can switch these banks. You can only actually see 16K at a time. And I just made sure that my, um, my VIC2 uh, IPC bridge code took that into account. Um, so I tried this on the simulator and uh, I got uh, text mode working. So um, I'm just gonna again go back out straight this here. Okay, so I'm gonna launch the simulator again with a window and this time I'm gonna ha add a dash B argument and that's the arg, or sorry, dash uh, Z. Uh, that's the argument I added to um, to tell the simulator to sit and wait for uh, step requests that come from uh, the Vice IPC bridge. So let me just move that over here. And in the second window, I'm just gonna run uh, Vice here. Uh, and I, I'll just run Vice with, um, with no program just to get to a basic prompt. 
So it's sitting there waiting. Uh, and to activate the uh, sync, I can just do poke54271, and that's the D3FF register. That's my fake register. And um, when I do that, you can see it will start to sync, and it just kind of picks up uh, mid-frame. And uh, it's quite slow, um, especially since I'm also recording this on my machine. Uh, but it's, it's stepping you know, uh, the, the clock one tick at a time. Uh, and uh, the Verilog uh, code is quite slow. But you can see um, it is... Now the reason you're seeing that text there is because the IPC bridge is uh, providing the data lines. Uh, it's sort of reacting to the address reads uh, by the VIC that, that it's setting on the data line. So it sets the data lines appropriately as I described earlier. And you get you know a full frame um, and uh, once uh, the simulator is done a frame, you'll see that frame show up here. So you'll notice on the right, the ready hasn't shown up yet, but once the simulator gets to the bottom uh, of the frame, you'll see vice update. And at that point, you can, you can compare visually um, whether they match or not, and there it is. So there's the ready showing up, and then it goes off and does the, the next frame. So the idea here is uh, a ton of work went into making Vice match the hardware. And I'm going to put my own efforts into making my hardware match Vice. And hopefully my hardware will end up matching the real hardware. Uh, <laughs> that's the idea anyway. So, so far it's been working out pretty well. Okay, so at this point uh, I brought in other modes. Um, I added uh, an alternate method of, of invoking the sync because uh, I noticed that when I ran certain programs, uh, they would actually poke that register and invoke the sync when I didn't want to. So I just added this, this mechanism to do it from the vice monitor. Uh, and, uh, and I added a, uh, a disable mechanism so that I could uh, turn it off and then turn it on when I needed it. Um, so, uh, in the previous simulation, you'll notice that uh, so nothing was printed um, by the vice output, and that's because everything was matching. But as soon as something, uh, as soon as a discrepancy is found, either a register doesn't match or, or one of the internal state bits don't match, then it would have printed something out uh, to tell me uh, something was wrong. So at this point, I started to bring in uh, programs and test out you know what things looked like. And uh, of course, I'm skipping over troubleshooting steps here, but I got um, you know bitmap graphics uh, working. So this is ghosts and goblins uh, running. Now the colors won't match because uh, again, because it's RGB uh, 222, and that's simply not enough um, uh, color resolution to match um, colors uh, uh, correctly. But uh, it, it basically is pixel by pixel match, um, and it's uh, demonstrating that. Uh, that the addresses are correct, the data reads are happening. So this was great because I could simulate pretty much any, or um, run through pretty much any program that I chose and uh, to see if, if there was some discrepancy found. Um, so one of the things that, that a core has to deal with is all the, uh, the demo tricks that uh, programmers use. Um, they take advantage of certain hardware glitches uh, in the, in, in, creating their the uh, visual effects that they want to create. So I tried this on the introduction to Comaland and um, this is the result of the uh, simulation. Um, you can see that the pattern matches. Colors are obviously off, but um, that's um, that can be fixed later. So I was pretty confident uh, that the core was working enough at this point to try uh, working out issues on real hardware. So what that involves is basically using a bunch of these 74LS245 uh, bus transceivers. And uh, I started hooking things up. Uh, there's a list of what I hooked up. I think I'm trying to recall exactly what I had hooked up at this point. The, the data bus lines may not have been there. I can't remember exactly, but um, I worked through, I used um, Rob's uh, schematic as a guide here. Um, but I did find some problems with his, uh, his schematic and ended up correcting them in, in my uh, rig here. Um, I could see that um, at one point the, the CPU, after I did this hookup, the CPU was actually running. I was getting a black screen, 
but I noticed that if I poked 53280, so that's the uh, the border color, I would just do this blind. Um, it would show a chip select line on the VIC2 socket dropping on my oscilloscope, which meant that BASIC was actually running. And I could also type load uh, dollar sign comma eight, and the disk light on my ST2IC would light up. Uh, so that means that CAS RAS refresh must have been working at this point too, um, because I could I could actually type in a program and it seemed to remember that program, uh, which I don't think would have happened if uh, the CAS refresh uh, CAS RAS refresh was not working. So I just proceeded in this manner, uh, no video. I noticed that I, this is when I, I, I'm just listing off the, uh, the some of the troubleshooting steps that I went through here. This is uh, by no means all of it, but um, I discovered that uh, the upper four bits of the data bus were permanently set to output because they were sharing one of the LS245s with the other output lines. And I thought this was probably an oversight on Rob's original design. So uh, I corrected this by throwing those four address lines onto their own uh, LS245 um, bus transceivers. And um, those are the, uh, the color lines. Um, and uh, I used uh, the AEC line to control the direction, just like the other eight lines, and that, that fixed that problem. I noticed that there were read-write conditions were backwards. I've, I discovered many timing issues. Um, and then I saw that I hooked back up the, uh, the data lines, and then things stopped working. The, the machine would stall. Um, and uh, the only way to get things back working to a semi-working state was to disconnect data lines. Uh, so after some very frustrating troubleshooting, um, I found out that I actually had my uh, row and column addresses backwards, uh, and, and this is what it looked like. Um, and I, I think this, this happened because I ended up, if you noticed earlier in one of my slides, I said that I cheated with the address I just, uh, in my simulation, I just took the address uh, from the Verilog, um, one of the Verilog internal registers, instead of actually simulating the uh, address multiplexing. So the VIC multiplexes the address that it's trying to ref um, uh, read from um, between the RAS and CAS pulses. Um, so uh, since I had those the, the row and column backwards, then it was uh, it was obviously not going to work. But once I um, got uh, the register writes working, I noticed that the colors were actually showing up. So this is basic booting, and uh, I could tell that it was running. Um, if I plugged in Jumpman Junior cartridge at this point, it would also initialize the border and the background colors correctly, and then it played the intro music uh, as well. So um, this is what it looked like after I swapped the row and column uh, addresses. Uh, Jupiter Lander would actually boot, but it would stall just like Jumpman Jr. Uh, would. It would just kind of crash uh, as soon as you started the game. And then finally, I discovered, uh, you know, as, as with most of these issues, there were timing issues. Um, and I just have a little note here about what the, what the issue was. There was a timing issue with uh, when you could take over the bus that uh, wasn't obvious to me, but maybe is somebody to somebody who uh, knows the uh, the behavior of this bus more. Um, even though AEC line was high and CE was low and read write was high, that's not sufficient. There are timing constraints uh, as well in there because uh, apparently you can't hold the data long the, the data lines for too long uh, inside the phi high cycle. But I have no idea why. But once I figured that out, I actually got uh, booted uh, into Basic and. Uh, yeah, so I had a what essentially was a homemade VIC chip. These lines are noisy, but I'm surprised that I'm actually getting quite a clear picture out of it. Um, so I've been iterating between the simulator, Vice, uh, the real hardware to build out more and more functionality in the FPGA core. Uh, fixed many glitches over the weeks. Um, this is what I've been doing, just kind of cycling through this simulating, tracing, investigate, fix and verify with Vice, test with the hardware, and uh, discovered uh, many, many issues. Um, and the current status is I just added sprites. Uh, this is mostly working. I'm having some trouble with collision detection. It's not 100% matching what Vice is telling me. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm making sure that I also support things like sprite crunch. And there's a, a reference to what that is. It's basically uh, a trick that takes advantage of a hardware glitch in the uh, the VIC chip that updates the sprite data pointer uh, 
kind of in a weird way so that you can skip through bytes and crunch or expand them in ways not thought possible before, or at least in ways that um, the engineers didn't uh, intend. And uh, one of the examples uh, of doing this is uh, Edge of Disgrace. There's this um, sequence where there's this flying fist, which is a uh, sprite that is being uh, expanded and shrunk. Um, and uh, there are a bunch of bad line tricks going on at the same time. And uh, another demo that I'm trying to work through is um, something that is taking advantage of um, another sprite crunch um, uh, trick and it's called uh, massively interleaved sprite crunch and I have another reference to that as well if you want to read that uh, and that happens in uh, one of the introduction sequences to uh, Lunatico uh, demo so I've been using these two demos I figure if I can get through these two without any discrepancies between my core and um, and what vice is telling me then I probably have a pretty close uh, uh, replica Okay, so I'm just gonna uh, launch the simulator one more time here and um, I'm gonna run um, Vice pointing to uh, the Lunatico demo. And uh, before that gets going, I have to disable my sync temporarily because I don't want it to trigger by accident. And I will warp through some of this uh, demo until I get to um, an interesting frame that I want to test out. So let's say I wanted to do this here and I wanted to make sure that the uh, that wavy uh, effect is working. So I go back into the monitor and I, this is the equivalent of poking that uh, that register. This is again my fake register and then you'll see it says in the bottom there Vic to sync hook activated and then when I exit then it starts to sync and if I click out and click back in, then when the FPGA simulator um, is done the frame, then you'll see that Vice will update its frame, and uh, then you can visually inspect uh, the difference. Now this is quite slow because uh, as I add more and more um, functionality, um, there's more for the simulator to, um, to handle, and uh, this was... Um, working much quicker before uh, I added sprites. And uh, see at the bottom, the device is explaining that there's a register and there's something in that that's not right. It seemed to be the video, but that's something I would investigate and uh, hopefully resolve. And of course, that's that printout is slowing it down even more. But you can see that uh, the, um, the, uh, the image is matching. Um, and I'll just fast forward through the rest of it from here. Okay, so it's just about to finish a frame, and when it's done the frame, you'll see Vice updates its frame, and aside from the colors, it's, uh, it's a match. So that was a successful test. Uh, is there interest in something like this? Probably. I found a few mentions. Uh, I don't think this would be um, an economically viable project. It's, it would probably cost multiples of what a, uh, a replacement Vic would cost. Um, but there's something appealing about a drop-in replacement that I think might be worth it, even though the cost would be higher. Um, if you buy an original VIC chip, you're buying a nearly 40-year-old chip that might fail at any time. Uh, this hopefully doesn't have the VSP bug. It would hopefully have better video quality. Um, you can make your 64 either a PAL or NTSC machine without any real hardware modifications at all, and that's because... Um, the clock circuit uh, is is just bypassed with this, so you could have a failing clock circuit entirely, and uh, dropping this in would would actually fix that. Well, not fix it, but just kind of uh, avoid that issue. Um, and it wouldn't generate as nearly as much heat. Uh, I'm guessing the power consumption might be lower. Um, and uh, I think what's more uh, appealing, even more appealing, is that you could probably add some extra goodies for the C64 hobbyist, like a gr new graphics mode to play around with, and maybe uh, like Rob's vision was uh, adding a math coprocessor. So that might, might make it worth um, buying something like this, uh, if, uh, even if the cost was more than uh, what it would cost to replace uh, a VIC chip. Uh, so in terms of cost at this point, I don't care how much it costs. I'm just uh, 
I'm kind of doing this for fun. You know, will this be a product? Maybe someday, I don't know. Uh, I'll open source this at some point at the very least. And, uh, you know, um, hopefully I can put together a board kind of like what Rob had done so that you could buy the, um, the FPGA development board and put together one of these and you could just plop it inside your computer. Um, but uh, to make this into a product would be quite quite a, a project. Um, you you know the, the FPGA development board has a lot of stuff on there that you don't you don't need. You would have to build your own board, um, and uh, that's something that's probably beyond me. Um, but uh, unless you did that, it 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 would make this project really quite expensive. That that CMOD A7 board, the cheap uh, the the smaller version is uh, at least a hundred dollars. So. Uh, you can you know go up from there because you need all the other components as well. So you'd probably end up looking at a couple hundred bucks um, for uh, one of these uh, do-it-yourself projects. Um, why composite? Uh, why not VGA or DVI HDMI? I just wanted a drop-in replacement. I kind of feel that the um, the problem of getting you know your 64 hooked up to an HDMI monitor has already been solved by an external device. Uh, an upscaler that will convert composite to HDMI. So uh, I don't really think it's necessary to output digital video directly from the uh, the drop-in. I would rather just uh, have something that I can put in there, close the computer up, and just kind of you know expect it to work as it did before. All right, so that's my uh, my deep dive uh, into um, my. Um, homemade uh, Vic. Let me turn down the brightness here again so you can see this. Uh, let me gingerly put in my Ms. Pac-Man cartridge here because I don't want to upset the uh, the wires. Turn it back on and I'll leave this video with me playing uh, Ms. Pac-Man. <laughs> 